Well, I'm sure the MIT folks will be delighted that you relocated their campus to Boston from Cambridge. <laughs> what, what I like to do is talk about what I think big data means. And mostly I want to talk about disruption, which is what's going to happen, uh, what's going to cause the deck chairs on the Titanic to shift around. And then I'm going to talk about the 800-pound gorilla in the corner, which is what I think is the most important problem to worry about. And I apologize for, for being uh, North American-centric. I should say the 57-stone gorilla <laughs> in the corner. OK, so th this should be familiar to everybody. When you talk about the big data, usually you mean one of the three Vs, which is if you have a big data problem, either you've got too much of it and you can't, you can't manage the petabytes, and people who have a big volume problem either say, I have a, I have, I'm trying to do simple SQL style analytics, or I'm trying to do uh, more complex analytics. I'll talk about both cases. Uh, the second V is the data is coming at you too fast and you can't keep up. Uh, so you have to drink from a fire hose. I'll talk about big velocity. And then, I'll and then the third V is if it's coming at you from too many places and you have a data integration problem. So I'll talk about all three uh, in order. And I'm told I can talk until 10.20 and then, then the hook will yank me off the stage. Okay, so if you want to do SQL analytics, uh, I know of 20 or so uh, data warehouses that are running multi-petabyte production systems day in, day out on multiple vendors, uh, you know, SQL products. And by and large, the major vendors are pretty good at uh, running gigantic clusters of hundreds of nodes with petabytes of data. So I consider this, you know, pretty well in hand. If you want to do SQL analytics on petabytes, go buy one of the commercial warehouse products. And everybody has more or less moved to the same architecture. They're all running multi-node systems on gigantic clusters. They're all partitioning your, your tables uh, over, the, over the nodes of those clusters. They're all running parallel column stores. Row stores were the rage uh, 15 years ago. Uh, column stores are wildly faster on data warehouse style queries. And everybody has moved to that architecture except Oracle. Uh, who turns loose their marketing people instead of their technical people when they have a problem. Uh, I'm always reminded, uh, on, what, on what platform do you think Oracle runs the best? It's a trick question, but anybody want to try that one? Uh, OK, PowerPoint. Uh, Actually, the correct answer is on a 35 millimeter slide projector. <laughs> anyway, anyway, I don't see anybody, you know, agonizing in pain over an attack by the gorilla. So there's no root gorilla here. Uh, the commercial vendors have this problem well in hand. And the big fly in the ointment, the huge disruptor here, is going to be the cloud. Uh, you are all going to move your data warehouses to the cloud sooner or later. Uh, adventuresome people, it's sooner. Other people, it will be later. Uh, the reason for that, I'll just tell you uh, Dave DeWitt's uh, vignette. Uh, turns out Microsoft Azure is putting up data centers as fast as they can. Their technology is shipping containers. They stuff them with boards, power in, chilled water in, internet in, otherwise sealed. Uh, roof and walls are optional. They're only there if you need it for security. And they put them in uh, geographic locations where the power is cheap. 
Uh, if it turns out to be cost effective, they'll put them in the North Sea under the ice up, up there. So if you think about where your data center is, raised flooring in Hammersmith is, it cannot possibly be competitive uh, against what the cloud guys are doing. So you will move there for, for, uh, because it will be cheaper. And so you'll be subject to uh, the, uh, the rules of the big cloud vendors. You either are going to be a cloud user or you're going to be a cloud vendor. So, so the mo huge scale is important. All the big boys are running multi-million node uh, worldwide uh, data centers. And they all play by different rules. So I'm interested to know that, for example, AWS uh, has two storage options. One is S3, one is the enterprise block store. They make S3 cheap and EBS expensive. So uh, everybody's going to run on S3 for cost reasons. And they price their internal database systems differently than the, than the outside vendors are stuck with. So this is a dramatic price advantage to the you know, in-house solutions. And then there are more than 50 t-shirt sizes, which are different collections of resources. And you all have to figure out which of these is advantageous for your workload. So cloud architecture is going to be a challenge. All of the warehouse vendors are going to re-architect their products to run efficiently on S3 uh, and other uh, cloud file systems. So they're all going to have to do major uh, surgery on their engines uh, to run efficiently on the cloud. They are all in the process of doing exactly that. And Snowflake, which is here on the, on the uh, exhibition floor, is sort of an example of where, uh, where warehouse architecture for the cloud is going. However, there's a huge disruptor in this world, which is warehouses are yesterday's problem, which is data science is going to supersede business intelligence, meaning business intelligence is simple SQL, data science uh, is uh, comp complex uh, operations. And as soon as you can all hire enough competent data scientists, you will move to the data science world. So yesterday's technology is business intelligence. Tomorrow's technology is going to be data science. It's very, very unlikely that you're going to be able to retread your business intelligence people to become data science because data science is basically array-based linear algebra. Uh, it's very different skill set than business intelligence. So you're all going to go there. And so what, what is data science? Well, I'll walk out on the exhibition floor. Uh, it, means a, it means at least three things. One is it means machine learning either deep, so-called deep learning or conventional ML. It means non-SQL data analytics. So principal component analysis, singular value decomposition, regression, linear regression, logistic regression, et cetera, et cetera. If you don't know what that stuff means, that's all in a linear algebra textbook, all linear algebra. And SQL, this is not on tables and it has nothing to do with SQL. Of course, what data science really means is whatever your marketing department says it means. So there's a huge amount of noise in this space. But anyway, you're all going to go there. And so more specifically, it's big analytics. So if you open up any one of these uh, complex linear algebra operations, what it really means is that it's a dozen or so inner loops. The most popular one is matrix multiply. So really inside all of this stuff is do matrix multiply at scale blindingly fast. And of course, that isn't going to be done by any of the warehouse vendors 
anytime soon. There are several reasons for that. Number one, this isn't a table-based world at all. Uh, number two, it has nothing to do with joins or SQL. Matrix multiply just looks differently. And the data structures you want to use for data warehouses are quite different than the ones you want to do to do sparse matrix multiply. So this is going to be very disruptive. Uh, and then at least in the US, machine learning is the rage. Uh, if you want to write research papers, machine learning applied to X, where X is whatever your favorite topic is. And deep learning is all the rage, and it's good at a, at a variety of things. It's great at finding ca pictures of cats on the internet. That's a standard example. It's good at natural language processing. However, it is not going to take over the world for two very simple reasons. The first one is it requires an enormous amount of training data. And most of you guys have problems where getting training data is a big issue. How come I get an echo? <laughs> How come I get an echo? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so requires, it requires a ton of training data to do deep learning, and sometimes you can get your hands on it, but lots of times you can't. <laughs> this is really annoying. <laughs> okay, so if you can't get your hands on tons of training data, then you're going to use conventional ML rather than deep learning. Second problem with, with deep learning is it's this convolution uh, computation inside all this circuitry. So you say, why did, why did you decide to give me a credit score, a, a low credit score, and thereby deny me a loan? Well, you know, the machine said so. So deep learning right now cannot be explained, and if you have to be if you have to be able to explain why you did something, then, then deep learning is not for you. So it will do some things, it won't do other things. And Amadeus, you know, uh, listened to a talk by one of their data scientists. They tried deep learning, they tried conventional machine learning, and they tried non-ML. And deep learning worked the best, but they decided not to use it because it's not explainable. So, not for everybody. If you are interested in ML, you will be running packages. Don't even think about writing your own low-level code. Scikit-learn is popular. TensorFlow is popular. All of these are very primitive packages. They have no data management, no persistence. So uh, I hope the packages will get a lot better. But just remember, they're early. They're, they're on version 1 or 2, not on version 10. You can certainly run stat packages to do this sort of stuff. Uh, you know, SAS, R, R is very popular, SPSS. They have weak or non-existent data management, and some people like this stuff. You can certainly do this sort of computation in array database systems. There are a bunch of startups who do this. Uh, they're starting to get traction in the genomic space. Is it, does this work any better? <laughs> no. How, how do I get it to stop? It's next door. It's not now. It's next door. Oh, okay. Okay, so you can certainly do your computation on Spark. Uh, the, uh, you know, they're, they're out here on the exhibition floor. My only problem with Spark is Spark SQL is not competitive again, against the other uh, warehouse uh, warehouse products. And then I, I love to complain about Hadoop, which I will do in the next slide. <laughs> so 
First of all, I have to tell you what I mean by Hadoop. So in 2010 or so, Hadoop meant MapReduce. And so I will use the word MapReduce because that's what it meant originally. MapReduce runs on top of the Google file system. Yahoo built an open source version of both of these. Hadoop was on top of HDFS. You all voted with your feet that said MapReduce was not an interesting system for anything. And in fact, uh, in fact Google stopped using MapReduce for, for the application for which it was purpose-built, namely managing the Google crawl. So they stopped using it in like 2011. You all decided that it wasn't worth anything. So Cloudera now has a big problem, which is they're, they're selling MapReduce and no one wants it. So in a superb, uh, in a superb marketing uh, exercise, they rebranded Hadoop to mean something completely different. So, so Hadoop became Redupe. And so Redupe meant the whole stack, Hive on top of MapReduce, on top of HDFS. Then they quietly dropped MapReduce completely out of uh, that stack. Impala, which is the Cloudera uh, warehouse engine, does not use MapReduce. So MapReduce isn't used for anything. And if you're using it, please stop. Hadoop now means realistically HDFS, which is a file system, and a bunch of tools on, on top of that. So this is sold as a platform for data lakes. We'll talk about data lakes in a bit. And so uh, Google has, has abandoned Hadoop, or re, uh, original Hadoop, MapReduce, and so they have to be laughing in their beer because they built, they built MapReduce purpose-built for their crawl database. You all said, well, whatever Google thinks, they're smart, they must, must be a good idea. So you all, you all said, great, let's, let's hop on the MapReduce bandwagon. And Google then dropped it all, said it was a bad idea, we've moved on. It's time for you guys to move on. <coughs> okay, so that's what I have to say about, uh, about big, big volume. Let's move quickly to big velocity. So velocity is going up. So you're gonna sensor tag everything of value uh, over time. That's gonna send velocity through the roof. In the US, all the car insurance companies are putting a gizmo in your car to record exactly how you drive and base your insurance rates on how you drive. Uh, 5G is gonna send volume through the roof. Uh, and then your kids love to play these multiplayer internet games uh, and that sends volume through the roof. So big velocity will be a bigger and bigger problem over time. So what do you do if you have a big velocity problem? Well, there are two kinds of uh, commercial products that do this. The first one is exemplified by electronic trading. So uh, electronic trading is looking for patterns in the fire hose that goes, goes by you on CNBC. It, you know, it's basically find me a strawberry followed within 100 milliseconds by a banana. Find me an instance where IBM goes up within 10 milliseconds, Oracle goes down. And, and you then trade based on those patterns. So complex event processing, there's CEP. There are a whole bunch of commercial products. Kafka is an interesting one and there are a bunch of others. Storm is not very competitive. But anyway, go buy a CEP product if this is what you want to do. Uh, they will be able to keep up with your fire hose. And since those guys are not storing your data, it just passes by, 
I'm not going to focus any more on this use case. I'm much more interested in the other use case. Uh, and so turns out, using electronic trading example, uh, there's an electronic trading company called Getco. They're in Chicago. Uh, as of a couple years ago, they were about 10% of the volume on the New York Stock Exchange. So they have an electronic trading system in Tokyo, another one in London, another one in New York. They're all over the world. And they are electronically trading at millisecond granularity. So they're looking for patterns, trading based on it, and they're distributed everywhere. And they're trading 60,000 or so uh, stocks. So their CEO is worried about the following problem. Suppose all their electronic trading systems all decide to short IBM at the same time. That will generate just a huge amount of risk if, they're, if they've all bet wrong. So the CEO wants to limit his risk and be able to pull the plug if, things, if the risk gets too high. So basically, ring the red telephone if my worldwide exposure millisecond by millisecond gets too high. So Getco is assembling every trade everywhere in the world in real time uh, to a set of machines in Chicago and are exactly coding this alert. So you look at this and you say, I better not lose any messages or I'm toast. And I can't crash because obviously that makes this application worthless. So this looks like high performance OLTP. So you want to update a database at very, very high speed. So this is what their application is. So this now sounds like a database problem. So how are you going to do this? Well, you can certainly run one of the standard commercial SQL products from one of the elephants. Uh, you can certainly run a NoSQL product. There are 75 or so vendors. Basically, what they advocate is giving up SQL and giving up ACID, saying both of those are too slow. And then there's a collection of what I call new SQL vendors who basically say, we can retain SQL and retain ACID, but you gotta, you've got to dump the architecture that's used by the elephants to be able to go fast. So please don't try and run Oracle on this problem. It's too slow by a couple orders of magnitude. On the other hand, you can certainly run one of the NoSQL folks, Mongo, Cassandra, Redis, those guys. Problem with NoSQL is NoSQL means no standards and no ACID. So don't try and do transactions with a non-ACID system. That's an opportunity to tear your hair out. And for most people, ACID is a really good idea. And by the way, the NoSQL guys are saying, please go back to coding in this low-level uh, low level utterances. And you know, declarative high-level languages are a really good idea. I have a lot of gray hair. I remember the 70s. This was debated for a decade, 40, 50 years ago. Declarative languages are a great idea. Procedural languages are not. So NoSQL is kind of on the wrong side of both of these issues. And of course, what they're doing is they are gradually getting high-level languages. Uh, Mongo and Cassandra both have high-level notations that, unless you squint, look exactly like SQL. And they're starting to get acid, acid into their engines. So they're moving toward uh, SQL-like systems. The new SQL guys are all main memory database systems. They're folks like VoltDB out here on the, on the uh, exhibition floor. Uh, MemSQL is another, another folk uh, that does exactly this. They have high availability built in. Uh, they don't use standard dynamic locking. It's too slow. And any one of these folks will do a million transactions per second on a reasonable sized cluster. 
I haven't yet met anybody who wants to go faster, but on the other hand, 5G is coming at us, so we'll see. So anyway, if you need to go fast, my point of view is use one of the new SQL systems uh, that will allow you to keep SQL and keep ACID, and they will keep up with your workload, and the NoSQL guys force you to give up stuff in order to go fast. But my point of view is there are commercial systems that are pretty much guaranteed to keep up with your workload. So I don't see any gorilla here. So there's no gorilla on big volume. There's no gorilla on big velocity. So where's the gorilla? It's in your big variety problem. So the 57 stone gorilla is here. And I'll give you a couple of examples of why this is a huge, huge deal. So if you look at what a data scientist actually does. So I know this chief data officer at Merck. This is his description of what his data scientists do. He's got about 1,000 of them. They have an idea. Does Rogaine cause weight gain in mice? So company wants to know the answer to this. So what does the data scientist have to do? He's got to find relevant data that's relevant to this, pro this question. So Merck has 4,000 or so Oracle databases. They got a big data lake, plus a bunch of files, plus they're interested in public data on the web. And so they've got a, they have a big data discovery problem to find stuff that might be relevant to s solving this question. And then you have to do data integration on these resulting data sets. I'll tell you what data integration means in a second. He says his data scientists spend 98% of their time doing, uh, doing, find, doing data discovery and data integration. My favorite quote is from a data scientist at iRobot. Those are the guys, it's a US company that builds the vacuum cleaners that run around your living room automatically. She said, I spend 90% of my time finding and cleaning the data for my analytic models. And then of the remaining 10%, I spend 90% of that time fixing my cleaning errors. So she spends 99% of her time doing data integration. 1% of her time doing the, the job for which she was trained to do. So if you are a data scientist, your real job description is data finder and integrator. You're not doing data science. That's sort of a side effect that you do half an hour a week. And the big problem is you have to do this because if you analyze dirty data, you're going to get garbage. So garbage in, garbage out. You've got to clean your data and integrate it, and that's your real job description. And that's killing everybody. I've never met any data scientist who claims they spend less than 80% of their time doing data integration. So this is a huge pain point. This is the 800-pound gorilla, 57-stone gorilla in the corner. So this is what data scientists really do, and it's killing them. The other version of the problem uh, is uh, an enterprise one. So maybe some of you do this, maybe some of you don't. So if I ask any of you, how many procurement systems does your enterprise have? Procurement system is, you know, procurement system is I want to buy some paper clips. I go to my procurement system. It spits out a purchase order. I take the purchase order down to Staples, and they give me the paper clips. That's what a procurement system does. The ideal enterprise has exactly one of them. Uh, it turns out General Electric has 75. Why do they have 75? Different story. So the GE CFO estimated they could save $100 million a year. That's about 80 million pounds, for those of you who don't like dollars, if it can figure out the following problem. If I'm one of these 75 procurement officers, 
when my contract with Staples comes up for renewal, if I can just find out what the terms and conditions negotiated by my 74 counterparts are, and then demand most favored nation status. All I have to do to save $100 million a year. Okay, is this on? Okay. So that requires integrating 75 independently constructed supplier databases. It's the same data integration problem. So you guys all want to integrate parts, customers, suppliers, lab data. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Is it working? It's not, not working yet. Okay, so if, you have a, if you're an enterprise-style person, you've got this problem. If you're a data scientist, you've got this problem. This is killing everybody. So why is it killing everybody? Well, you've got a bunch of local data sources. You've got to ingest the source, say, into your favorite data lake. And then you've got to perform transformations. Just for example, if you're the human resources person in Paris, I'm the human resources person in New York. You have employees, I have employees, you have salaries, I have salaries. Your salaries are in euros after taxes and include a lunch allowance. My salaries are gross in US dollars, no lunch allowance. You can't just put this stuff together. You've got to make it semantically compatible. A dirty little secret is your data is dirty. Round numbers figure 10% of it is wrong or missing. So you've got to clean it up and that's really difficult. You've then got to line up all the fields so you can union your data. You've then got to deduplicate the result because GE wants to deduplicate uh, these independent supplier databases. That's their whole, their whole shtick about uh, finding terms and conditions. And often in a cluster of duplicates, you want to find golden records. If you have a cluster of, of records that correspond to me, if one record says I'm 69, the other record says I'm 74, at most one of those is correct. So this is what you have to do, and it's a challenge. Worse yet, you've got to do this at scale. GE has about 10 million suppliers. Toyota Motor Europe has a custom, you know, they have independent distribution in all European countries. If you buy a Toyota in Spain and you move to France, they develop amnesia. They don't want to do that. So they're in the process of integrating 30 million customer records uh, in 250 databases in 40 languages. So you've got to do this at scale. So don't even think about naive algorithms in Python. At scale, this is a serious problem. You can't run any n-squared algorithms. To get an answer in n-squared, you're going to have to not go out for lunch. You're going to have to take a long vacation. So do this at scale. The traditional solution is to run uh, extract, transform, and load packages. And those have, in general, uh, had master data management tools added to them. Variety of vendors sell you this stuff. And the trouble with ETL and MDM is there's too much manual effort. You send a programmer out to look at a data source and he manually figures out what to do. If you want to do schema mapping, you put one schema here, one schema here, start drawing arrows between them. Too much manual effort. Also, the whole technology depends on writing rules, and that stuff doesn't scale either. So the traditional solutions don't work very well. There are a bunch of startups uh, that do what's now called data prep. Uh, Trifacta, Paxata, Cambridge Analytics, dot, dot, dot. 
They're very easy to use solutions for simple problems. But if you want to do this in, for, at scale, you've got to run machine learning. You cannot do this in any other way. And so uh, there are a bunch of, bunch of startups that do this kind of stuff, including one that I'm involved in. So future of data integration, which is the 800-pound gorilla. There's a lot of startups in this space, uh, some focusing on various ways to do this. It's certainly the Wild West. Hold on to your seatbelt. But this is a problem that's killing you. And, uh, and to get serious about solving it, you're going to have to in use some of these technologies. So the summary, machine learning is going to be omnipresent. Uh, some deep learning, some conventional ML. Complex analytics is in your future no matter what. And both of them will go nowhere unless you can get clean data. And this requires data integration at scale, which is the 57 stone gorilla in the corner. So in my advice, start worrying about the 57 stone gorilla. Uh, that's, that's the high pole in this particular big data tent. Thank you very much. I think I have not run over. So thank you very much. <laughs>